to protect the right to housing in balance with other rights. The, as I said, we're speaking here on behalf of Mercy Law Resource Centre, an independent law centre providing free legal help for people who are homeless or facing homelessness. We've been established for over seven years now. Over the past two years, every week, we're meeting individuals and families who are homeless, who are sleeping in their cars, or who are every day finding accommodation for that night. Night to night is, is the term that is used and thrown around. These people every day are looking for somewhere to sleep that night. They include families with infants, very, very uh, young babies. Uh, and this committee, I know, is, is aware of that. The families and people who we are helping in this really acutely distressing situation are cast adrift. Uh, we're helping them because they are cast adrift, because they are told by the local authority that they, uh, there is no emergency accommodation available or that they do not qualify for emergency accommodation. So there is a refusal to provide them with that basic protection. Um, we meet families who are uh, being accommodated for prolonged and indefinite periods in one room in hotels and B&Bs. Uh, that accommodation is grossly inappropriate um, at, for their needs, for their health and for their dignity. Um, in this accommodation, they, for example, we hear this a lot, they cannot cook for themselves. They are often uh, long distances from schools and that journey to school for the children may one quite often that they simply cannot may be one that they simply cannot take and what we are seeing now over the last number of months is an evolution of the problem further uh, where we are seeing these families and the children that we are with the parents representing they are there for now uh, long periods nine months 18 months no end in sight and what we are seeing now with these people that we're representing is such severe effects on their mental and physical health that they're going downhill. Um, and that is a new, a new evolving problem um, that we are going to be facing. Um, Deputy Function mentioned there about the, in relation to private rented, the difficulty for children having to move around. If you translate that into emergency accommodation, a night to night situation, the effect for families uh, and children, we, we, won't, we don't yet know fully the effects that that will have. Um, so, there's no right to housing in Irish law. And as I say, we provide legal help for people who are in this desperate situation. And the real effect of that lack of right, the real effect of the absence of the right to housing, is that in these situations, there's no clear right to rely on. The, when we represent those families, it's the rights around the edges are what we're having to invoke. We're having to talk about, uh, in, in our pleadings in the courts, thing, when it gets to that stage, bodily integrity, privacy, family life. We cannot directly challenge the fundamental failure to provide emergency accommodation. And the gap in the law in that sense is clear. It is very clear. Um, so what the right to housing would mean is that the courts could look at the state decision or policy as to whether it was proportionate by reference to the right. Um, it would mean that government um, and state policies and actions would have to reasonably protect the right. For example, if the state decided to cut funding to homeless accommodation, the courts could review that in a case. We, we can't re review that directly now. Uh, the courts have no oversight over that particular issue. Um, the failure of rent supplement to meet market rent could be challenged by reference to the right. Um, a point that was raised earlier on today by, by Claire Nocton, Nocton from Community Law and Medi Mediation, the fact that there's no legal aid, and we would say in particular for evictions, people being evicted from their homes without any legal representation uh, at a court level, the fact that there's no legal aid for evictions, that could be challenged by reference to the right. It would mean that this is not just simply about going into court, uh, because ultimately cases are rare, by, uh, almost by definition. Legislation and policy, though, would have to be proofed to ensure that it reasonably protects the right in the same way as it is in relation to other substantive rights. So that at that early stage, there is a check to see, does this reasonably protect the right to housing? So what it would mean is that policies in relation to housing and homelessness would not, could not be on a political whim and, and could not be uh, simply based on the the philosophy of the, of the particular uh, reigning government, uh, as, as Mr Drury mentioned, it would instead have this grounding. It would have to have this basic grounding, this obligation to respect the right. 
And in that, that sense, it would be an enduring protection that stays a fundamental floor. Um, in relation to the right itself, it, it may be useful for the committee to know that the right to housing is recognised in Europe in the constitutions of Belgium, Finland, Greece, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain and Sweden. And it's, it is recognised and protected in the legislation of Austria, France, Germany, Luxembourg and the United Kingdom. Around the world, the right is recognised in 81 constitutions. And the right itself is a very evolved right. It actually was first recognised uh, in the Declaration, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights back in 1948. That was where the right to housing was recognised as an international human right. It was then made binding, essentially, in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which came into force in 1976. And it's also recognised and protected in the European Social Charter. The other important point about where this sits and in, 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 in where we are is that in 2014 the Constitutional Convention of which you're aware, drawn of citizens across the country, set up by the government uh, and tasked to consider changes that would be appropriate to our Constitution considered this right. It considered economic, social and cultural rights and it considered the right to housing in particular. And it, they voted overwhelmingly in favour of protecting the right to housing in the Constitution. 84% voted in favour of it being protected in the Constitution. This was the same convention that the marriage equality referendum came from. Uh, the government, though, in this situation has not taken any further substantive action on it. So this uh, what we are putting forward here in relation to the right to housing is building on what's gone before. But we are at a time now where it is highly appropriate and necessary to look at it. Um, we're, as I say, in Mercy, in Mercy Law Resource Centre, calling for this protection of the right in the Constitution to be a key priority of the next all. Now, the call does form part of our broader policy work including a call for legal aid for evictions uh, and a rise in rent supplement levels to meet market rent. Um, I would just say that both of those very important points would be easier to achieve if we had a right to housing in the Constitution. Um, the right to housing would help those who are facing homelessness now um, and it would be a fundamental safeguard against the recurrence of this unacceptable crisis again. Uh, what it really is is a recognition that home is central to the dignity of every person. Um, the, what we would say to the committee is that the crisis is a, a call to us to ask ourselves what we consider that an evolved, decent and humane society protects for every person. The right to housing in the Constitution would uh, put in place a basic protection uh, in recognition that a home is central to the dignity of each and every person and a foundation of every person's life. And we do consider that it would be a positive, uh, a, a positive and enduring step and that this is the time now for leadership in this area uh, and it is a prime opportunity uh, to put in place this enduring protection. So we thank you for the opportunity to discuss it. Thank you very much. Uh, just before I open it, I, just one minor question and you might clarify it. Uh, you mentioned that the right to housing is in a number of constitutions and it's protected by legislation in other countries. The previous speaker before you, Professor Drudy, uh, made reference that legislation might be quicker and easier than a constitution. And I suppose the, the specific question I'd ask you, which would afford the better protection? Is there a significant difference from a legal point of view? And it's just based on that previous discussion, mm. and then I'll open there. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I heard uh, Mr. Drury's point on that, which was, it's very good to tease that out. The better protection, the more enduring protection is in the Constitution. Because once the Constitution is the people's document and once it is changed, uh, it is not easy to change it again. And that is its strength because legislation can be changed by governments. Government to government can change it. So it doesn't become that enduring protection. Um, so in the Constitution, it endures. In legislation, and protection and legislation would be welcomed also, better if, if, if nothing else is possible, better to have that protection than none for sure. But the Constitution is where the real uh, protection lies in relation to this, because that is what, that is, it is by reference to that that all policies would have to be made, and, and, and legislation. Yeah. Thank you. Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, uh, Chair, and, and thanks, May, for the, the presentation. Uh, the first thing is just to, to warmly congratulate you on the report itself. I mean, a, a fair number of us here were at the, uh, the launch. Uh, I don't think I've been at a launch as, as packed uh, in Buzzwells for a... a NGO sector document for a long time and I think that says a lot both about Mercy Law and about the issue. 
uh, and I'd really recommend people to read it. It's a short report. Uh, it's, it's very accessible, uh, and I'd commend it to members. And also just by way of information to say Sinn Féin published a constitutional amendment bill last week on, on this very subject and is something we're hoping to bring before the floor of the Dáil now that it's going to be up and running. Just a couple of very practical questions, Maeve. Obviously one of the things that people who argue against uh, the constitutional right to housing reference is the cost. That What are the cost implications of this? And, and even uh, I think in the South African uh, model that you mentioned in the document, there is some caveats in their constitutional protection within the available resources or whatever. So I'd just like you to tease out your view of that particular debate and your response to that argument that opponents of the right to housing the constitution would uh, put forward. The other interesting thing is, is there are two phrases you use in the document and you used again in the presentation, basic floor of protection and reasonably protect. Now, those things clearly have a meaning to you as a, a practising lawyer. They might mean something different to people outside of law, and I'm just interested for you to kind of explain in more practical terms what do those things mean? What tools would they provide both yourselves and those of us who advocate for people with housing needs if they were in the Constitution? Uh, and then the last thing is, because again, you talk a lot about South Africa, but I would have been more interested to, to know a little bit more about maybe a more comparable EU member state. So is there one EU member state you could pick out of that has a constitutional right to housing uh, and tell us the benefits of that for them? Because I think maybe that's a better comparator for us than, say, South Africa, um, if possible. Thanks, Chair. Thank Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Irwin. Um, in relation to yeah, the resources, it is always the argument against any economic, social or cultural right is that this affects resources. Um, the, the way, and indeed the way the Convention voted, the way this uh, right is defined in international human rights law in the Convention is that because it is an economic or social right, it, the obligation is to pro progressively realise the right. It's not an absolute right. And also, progressively realise to the maximum of available resources. So there is always the caveat of resources. I mean, it is, uh, it is built in to the, how the right can be developed and how the right is understood that it is always within the resource choices that the state has at any given time. That is the only realistic way any of these rights could be in, uh, inter interpreted. The other thing to say about resources is that other rights that we have cost money too. Um, you know, civil and political rights, plenty of them cost money. So there, it, it, the right to housing is no different in that sense. I mean, I suppose the right to a fair trial, the right to vote, the provision of legal aid, they are, they are civil and political rights. They are uh, rights that we um, fundamentally accept here and they cost money also. But as I say, it also is to be progressively realised to the maximum of available, res of available resources. Um, and that wording would be, very, would be most appropriate um, in a constitutional provision. Uh, in terms of what reasonably protect means, the reasonably protect makes clear that this is not an absolute right but that there are choices and balances to be made. And the level, the reason we use South Africa in the report, and you are, I, I completely see the point that it would be interesting to look at an EU country, um, and I should say that our next report, our follow-up report, is going to be on comparing EU countries, because people will be interested to see how that works in the country. The reason we use South Africa is because the courts have been very good at explaining how they interpret the right. So what reasonable is, is that they will not get into the minutiae of the decision, but they have to be able to see that there was a reasonable, uh, a reasonable protection of the right by reference to what the state was doing with that particular policy, if that makes sense. Um, the other, yeah, and the EU member state point, that, yeah, that is a very good point. The, the country I would actually refer to is Portugal um, as having a, a constitutional right to housing. However, we actually are developing that research because um, the, uh, we want to actually bring that down and compare it to Ireland, and we're currently working on that, and we'd be happy to provide that when we, when we have done that. In terms of what it does in any, any uh, European country, um, uh, is it, it does provide that floor of protection. Um, in Scotland, they have, fa have had a very uh, proactive approach to ending homelessness, basing it in law, and it has been hugely effective in Scotland. So um, the, the law, based on a constitutional right, which, which we would be uh, calling for here, uh, can be very effective. Thank you. Deputy Coppinger. Um yeah, hi. Um, obviously, I wouldn't have a problem with putting a constitutional right to housing. Um, I just wanted to ask, similar to what was touched on, um, do you believe that legislating would not be enough because 
The reason I, I raise it is obviously Britain doesn't have a constitution, but it has a right to housing. I, I think most European countries don't have really constitutions. Um, and uh, I, I'm just wondering, would you also advocate that there should be legislation brought in, you know, straight away to assert that those rights? Um, I, I suppose the reason I raise it is I would have a problem sometimes with the constitution continually being invoked as being the only way that you have rights in this country, if you know what I mean. Because it's, it's very hard to obviously change uh, the Constitution, you know, repeal the Eighth Amendment and so on. Um, but uh, it's just sometimes it's overly invoked, but I, I, I wouldn't have a, a problem with, with the premise. It was just maybe to... Um, at the launch I had last week, it was mentioned families are being forced to stay in emergency accommodation for nine to 18 months. Uh, are these lengths of stay becoming normalised from what you've found? And you, you've mentioned impact on, on families, parents and children. What's the longest that you've come across for a family in emergency accommodation? Um, yeah, the, the other reason I suppose I raised the question about the Constitution is children's, children are meant to have rights in the Constitution, but we all know it means nothing. Sure, like it's daily ignored, you know? I mean. Um, women are not meant to have to leave the home to get a job, but obviously that's been ignored for like a long time. So this morning, Edmund Honahan uh, mentioned the possibility of uh, CPOs on the basis of children's rights in the constitution, you know, that children are being impacted from homelessness and using the law, you know, the recent uh, children's referendum. Do you think that is a possible basis for keeping families in their homes um, in private rental or mortgage arrears? And then just lastly, at the launch last week, Paul Sweeney from Task put the question, can we finance a major housing programme to deal with all the major housing problems? And he said the answer was an unequivocal yes. Would you agree with that? And that the only way to fully provide really for the right to housing is by ensuring that the state in particular builds public housing or local authority housing, as my uh, comrade over here on the right was arguing for this morning. Um, the, uh, the idea of, I, I do agree, the, the term social housing is now kind of becoming a term of stigma. Um, in the past, obviously, local authorities built roughly a third of housing. When I was a child, that's the way it was. Like so, um, but would you? And I'm not. I'm sure you're not only advocating legal changes. Anyway, you're just highlighting this in particular. But uh, fundamentally, the only way we can guarantee people's right to housing is by if the state recognises that it shouldn't be just left to the private sector as a source of speculation, and that they have to intervene and build housing on a major scale. Thank you, Deputy. Um, okay. um, thank you, uh, Deputy Coppinger. There's a lot there, so um, thank you for that. Uh, the first one, uh, your first point, would legislation be good enough, essentially, um, instead of the constitutional change? Our, our point would be that the constitutional change would be the best of all, and it would be the most enduring and sound. You would still need legislation to if, well, in fact, court cases could evolve it, but the better thing is to have legislation that then protects it. Legislation can, um, right, I suppose two things about it. Number one, if you were to protect the right to housing in legislation, that would, be, that would be quite helpful. It would certainly be very helpful. The concern is, of course, that legislation does get changed and amended, um, and it, can be, it basically can be changed. It can be quick, but equally it can be changed quickly. That would be our biggest concern with legislation protecting this right, it being a fundamental right. Its home, we consider, is in the Constitution. Um, in terms of legislation, though, um, a couple of points that were raised, for example, this morning by Claire Nocton from CLM, there are areas where legislation, yes, would really help. Um, the... I won't go into those areas now because uh, in, in detail, but there are, there are a number of issues uh, at the moment. For example, uh, in terms of priority, I don't want to go too off the, the point here, but in terms of what happens when you're given homeless or medical priority, um, in terms of medical priority at the moment, it's almost, it really doesn't mean very much in terms of how quickly you will be housed. So there is definitely areas that legislation could um, uh, assist. 
and indeed the obligation, for example, on local authorities to actually provide accommodation, that doesn't exist in legislation at the moment, and it certainly would be helped if there was legislation on that. So there's a real role for legislation, particularly into getting into the detail of what's going on. Um, but as I say, the right is a fundamental right is best protected in the Constitution, but legislation can certainly help and alleviate, um, um, that's for certain. Um, in terms of the length of stay and what is, uh, whether eight, uh, nine to 18 months is becoming normal, um, we uh, as an organisation are working with people who are at the most desperate edge of homelessness because they now need legal help to access basic entitlements. So I say that um, because Organisations like Focus Ireland would be better at doing a statistical overview of what's happening in terms of length of stay. But in terms of what we would see, we would be seeing people um, and working with families who would be in accommodation to, from 8 to 18 months, yes, um, uh, regularly in terms of who we're working with. The longest uh, situation we've seen, I think, might be nearly two years. Um, the, uh, we had a recent case and actually they were uh, ultimately uh, housed, which was very good news, but after a lengthy representation. So that was nearly two years uh, in emergency accommodation with a young family. Um, children's rights and uh, yeah, uh, whether... So um, I know the Master of the High Court was talking about CPOs by reference to children's rights and we wouldn't be able to speak to that in terms of expertise in that area. But in terms of children's rights being uh, an approach to alleviating the situation for people on an individual basis, um, we, we actually do try to invoke children's rights in relation to the family situation but it is limited actually how much we can we can do that uh, we in fact are working on that in our cases as to how uh, we can really use those rights but they are evolving and um, it's really not a very it's not we know it's not going to be the direct route as such although in, in certain cases it's helpful um, I don't know if that answers the point about children's rights. Yeah. Um, then uh, Paul Sweeney yes um, who he was he the I think he is the chief, the chair of the Economist Network with Task. Yes, he spoke at our launch, um, and he did. His bottom line was, yes, we have the money, and we we would. Uh, we, we we're not economists, but it would appear that we do. Um, and we did when we were greatly much poorer. Uh, as we know, social housing in the 60s and 70s, we were well able to do that then. So why, why can't we do it now? And in terms of the solution about whether local authorities need to be building, is that, was that your point, uh, Deputy Coppinger, that local, author local authorities should be directly building social housing? Well, obviously not directly with their own hands, but uh, actually doing it, taking charge of it. Was that the point you were making? Yeah. Or, whether, or yeah. whether, the question whether they should? Um, well, the... Again, the method of achieving greater social housing, we wouldn't be expert on, we wouldn't be in a position to comment on that, but the need for social housing um, and actually building it, uh, we would absolutely call on and endorse because that is ultimately the, the, the major problem, of, major cause of homelessness. Um, so yes, we would call on so, greater, greater social housing absolutely as fundamental. Mm. Thank you. Deputy Butler. Um, thank you, Maeve, as well. Um, I hadn't heard of Mercy Law until I went to Boswell's, until I received the invitation, and um, I went over and I was very impressed, and I, I did a bit of research into it then, so, um, and I'd like to compliment you on the work you're doing. It's, it's not something we would have uh, access to down the country, so I think you're doing fantastic work. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, obviously, this is a Housing and Homelessness Committee, and we're trying to come up with ideas that would, you know, hopefully that we would be able to put some um, solutions uh, quickly forward. Um, do you think it would make any difference in, in, in short term if it, this was in, in, enshrined in the Constitution? Do you think it would, make, would have any real impact in the short term? Um, the second question, I, I, I heard you mention there earlier in your presentation that um, there was no legal aid for evictions for people who are being forced through the courts for evictions. No free legal aid, I presume you mean. Yes, yeah. no free legal aid. Is, sure. yeah, you, you, might, you might give us a little bit more detail on that. I was so surprised to hear that because, you know, free legal aid seems to be there for anyone. So um, recently, you know, it was in the, in the media again. And the third question is, um, has any other group or organisation um, tried to have this, the constitution changed in this aspect? That, you know, are you the first group ever to try and do this or has it ever happened before? Um, you know, were people unsuccessful? Um, they're the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Butler. Um, 
So if, if the right was enshrined in the Constitution, what would be the short-term effect of that? Uh, would there be any short-term and remediate effect? Um, in terms of what we do, if there was a right to housing in the Constitution and where we meet a family, uh, for example, a fa families that we would meet reasonably regularly, say we met a family with a child with a very severe disability who was not being given emergency accommodation or was being given emergency accommodation that was totally inadequate, and that is something we're seeing quite a bit, where people have a disability or medical issues, the emergency accommodation is completely inappropriate. We would be able to challenge that in a court, and it's not just about that particular family who we would be wanting to help, but rather if the... Uh, if the, now, so I should say that before we would ever go to court, we, have, we first work with the council, like get in touch with the council and try to find a solution. And sometimes they will actually change the policy based on what we're pointing out as the law in relation to it. And that is obviously a very effective result. So in that sense, we would be able to point to that and say that is not a, a, a reasonable protection of this person's right to housing. So in that sense, it could be, it would immediately have an effect where it is invoked, where it is brought to book in relation to policies and legislation where people actually point out that this policy or, or piece of legislation needs to change. So yes, in that sense, um, it would. In terms of no free legal aid, yeah, the, the um, entitlement to civil legal aid is limited. And FLAC, are, uh, the free legal advice centres, are uh, really the kind of the, 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 the oracle in relation to the entitlement and the lack of entitlement to legal aid. In fact, they point out that in relation to civil legal aid, it's really legal aid for family cases and there's huge waiting lists. In terms of other legal aid, um, Claire uh, Nocton pointed out this morning that there is no entitlement to legal aid for disputes over rights and interests over land, and that has been interpreted as including uh, your housing situation. So not only do we see that in terms of people being evicted, say, from local authority accommodation, and now it's going to be determined by the district court under new legislation, which is to be welcomed, that the district court will decide ultimately, is this a proportionate eviction? But there is no entitlement to legal aid for that. Um, the only circumstances in which, in theory, you would be entitled to is where at and, and it, is not a, it is not an absolute entitlement, but they may allow you legal aid if you have an infirmity or a disability. Now, we've tried to invoke that um, to no success um, because um, at the legal aid board level, at the level that they go, uh, we've referred people to, because obviously we can't, as a solicitor, represent the person and ask for legal aid. It's just, you know, we have, the person has to go themselves. They've been told, no, there's no such entitlement. So it's something that is being worked on at a, at a policy level to try and make that exception at least work. Um, but no, there is no entitlement. Entitlement, and, and it is a very big gap, especially with the. Um, I would just mention one other uh, situation that we've seen, which represents the other side of that. Not only people in social housing, but uh, people in private rented who are being evicted. We we, we dealt. We worked with a family who. Um, were, were evicted from private rented accommodation because it was acquired by a receiver and they were told in the circuit court just before Christmas that they had seven days to vacate. No representation. This person came to us in our clinic um, faced with this. She was now overholding, um, but she had had no legal representation. And on a basic level, if, if she had, certainly a stay would have been put on, on it. Even if you couldn't do much more, you can actually hold the situation or negotiate. So, yeah, th there is no legal aid there, and it's a huge lack. Um, and that is one of the things we're really calling for and working on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, thank you. Last question. Did anybody else ever try and bring it forward, this legislation? Sorry. Um, yeah, well, actually, this, uh, the, the, what we are calling for is, is, I don't want to speak for them, but we know, and they've been vocal about it, uh, is also supported by, for example, Peter McFerry Trust, Focus Ireland, Threshold, these or Dublin Simon, these organisations have all uh, called for the protection of the right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. And, and the Constitutional Convention. Indeed, yeah. and the Constitutional Convention, yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. And yeah. Deputy Butler, and I'm not meaning to cut uh, Ms Regan short, uh, the primary focus of her, her, her contribution was in relation to um, the, this constitutional change, and, and the debate has opened in relation to other affected issues, and some of those uh, we've been conscious of, so FLAC at some point are, will be appearing here to follow up on exactly those points. Deputy Function. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'm not sure if... Um I, first of all, I agree completely with the, the whole about having it in the Constitution, the right to housing, and I'm glad to see you bring up the stuff about the mental health in relation to children, because I think, do think that does get overlooked a lot. Um, I'm just wondering, from a practical point of view, if it was the, if the right to housing was in the Constitution, would that assist in cases where, because I come across this an awful lot, 
um, where someone is put on notice to quit, the landlord follows all the rules in terms of your 84 days, maybe or dependent on your tenancy and stuff. But there really is not actual. Nobody can ever get to the bottom of the reason as to why they're, you know, generally they're taking it back um, to possibly um, increase the rent or because they don't maybe no longer want to be in sort of uh, the rent allowance category. You know, but it's very difficult because the house is there and there's really no reason for them to be evicting tenants. But once they sort of go by the rules in terms of here's your letter, here's your right notice, there's very little challenge. Would that um, help in situations like that? realistically, if it was in the Constitution. Deputy. Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, um, on one level, this is not the answer to everything. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just not. It's, it's one aspect of a pathway through the crisis that we're ha we have. Um, but the point you raise is um, a very, I suppose it's a thorny issue that we see that a lot of the time what we're doing for people is who are faced in that situation, we're noticed to quit and they need to get out, is trying to negotiate more time. Would a right to housing help? I think it would depend on the situation. Uh, perhaps if there was a receiver, this would be a difficult legal argument though, um, but perhaps if there was a receiver and there was a family in a very severe uh, situation, perhaps with illness or disability or young children, that there may be the ability to, um, uh, to in some way negotiate. It would be difficult, to be honest. Um, I'm trying to think in terms of, I think perhaps where the right to housing may assist with that is in... Um, in addressing those situations potentially in legislation to provide greater protection, particularly in the case of where receivers are taking over property, um, that we'd be looking at it at that level because as the, as the legislation stands, if the person has a valid reason, you know, equally there's, the, you know, the, the, the landlord may have a very valid reason for um, evicting a person, there's always going to be that balance of interests. Um, so where the right to housing might help with that is in terms of making sure there's the right balance in legislation in terms of protections, if that okay. is. Because you yeah. often see that um, there's no real reason given as such. And I don't know, maybe they're not, well, landlords are not supposed to be doing that, but like, mm. um, and then next thing you see the property up on daft, but it's for an extra two or 300 euro. You know, it's like that's, yeah. those kind of things would, I mean, I know what you're saying, this isn't the, the answer to everything, but I'm just wondering, would it, would it help in tackling that kind of stuff? Um, yes, actually, the, the, um, what you're saying there, if a landlord is doing that and there isn't the valid reason for it, first of all, he should have to give reasons, but there are ways of challenging it through the PRTB that that may not be a valid notice to quit for starters. Um, so, so there is legislation there. It just may not be the awareness of it, but there are protections for that. So we would, uh, we have been before the PRTB challenging notices to quit on the basis that they weren't valid in those kind of situations. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Deputy O'Dowd. Uh, just, I was at the uh, launch last week and I was very impressed. Uh, I think that what you're talking about, really, the right would be in an extreme case, particularly, say, like there's eviction of travellers from a site, an illegal site, that was at commas in Dundalk today, that it, it would give them, you know, grounds to appeal legally or it would put new or extra obligations on local authorities to ensure that if and when it comes to that stage that they must have exhausted all of the other possibilities and they would be required, if there was a court case, to enumerate them and outline you know, what they actually tried to do. So in other words, decisions when people are in extremists like that, when there was no alternative uh, to, you know, to being evicted from the perspective of the person who was being put out, that it would require the evictor to to absolutely full diligence and all to considerations and you know obligations in terms of community welfare officer consultation, local authority consultation, homeless. You know, if it, I think that would the strength that I see in it. Uh, and at the same time, if somebody uh, was clearly having parties 24/7, was behaving antisocial as they can and they do in housing estates, that you know there would have to be a requirement. You know that they would have to behave behave reasonably as well. In other words, you couldn't have people behaving unreasonably, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, absolutely unreasonably, uh, you, know, pre you know what I'm talking to you about, selling drugs or whatever. There are issues, you know, which wouldn't make it absolute, you know, that they would have to be, you know, and I think the key point would be in selling this would be to enumerate, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the areas around it 
to clear up issues in relation to that. You know, if somebody, even though they would have a reasonable income or an income refusing to pay the rent or, you know, but particularly I'm thinking of antisocial behaviour, which is a huge issue in, in, in my area in some cases. The other point I think is very important and speakers this morning addressed was the question of people with significant medical problems, uh, which can occur suddenly if somebody has a stroke, uh, which can occur. Uh, and, and I know this is slightly... It's not off the issue, but if I'm in a house and I've had a stroke and the toilet in the bathroom is upstairs, I can't go up there anymore. Uh, and yet the, the local authorities have a limit to the funding that they use you know, for, for housing adaptation grants. And I think if it would help those cases and put a greater obligation on local authorities and the state to meet those very significant human needs by adjusting the accommodation to suit those disabilities, I think would be very important as well. I think, I don't know if you've thought about that, as supporting, you know, in a, it's just broadening the, 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 the entitlement of the individual who's in a very difficult situation. Or alternatively, and finally, where I have a case at the moment where a lady has to have a very serious operation, she's going to be in a wheelchair, you know, that's it, you know, that's it, unfortunately. There's nothing can be done for her. So the council have to get her another house, right? But she feels, and I feel, they're not looking for one fast enough. You know, and they're, they're, they are on the market. Uh, so it, it would require, you know, I don't... She shouldn't have to chase the local authority to get her rights. You know, they should be vindicated by, by the nature of such, a, such an amendment to the Constitution, which I think would, would strengthen in the case of, of people like that. Thank you, Deputy. Um, I, th I think it's a, a, a very good point, Deputy O'Dowd, that certainly in cases, generally you'll be looking at extreme cases in relation to the right. Um, the situation that you described there, uh, that it can't be absolute because where people are, where there's severe antisocial behaviour going on, for example, that they, and actually I think that is a very good uh, way of identifying that uh, somebody else's right to housing is being interfered with by that behaviour, so there is that balance uh, always having to go on, and that would always be there. Um, in terms of um, the situations you describe of people with severe medical need and would the right to housing help th them, overall, certainly it would. It would be a greater... Uh, because uh, as the right has been evolved and uh, defined in, in, in international human rights law, it has a number of different uh, elements, um, but abs the adequacy of it is, is fundamental to the right also. Uh, uh, also, though, linked to that, um, the, what the, con the constitutional right would do, uh, one would hope, and it would be sensible, would be that policy and legislation would then come into line with it, so that the scheme of letting priorities, for example, for a transfer would would yes, would, would better cater for that situation. The, the priority uh, process better would cater for it. So it would filter through um, to the policies that are there. Um, so this isn't about a case-by-case -case, uh, situation. Um, in the best-case scenario, it, it just it, it, it makes policies and legislation uh, uh, more, uh, more balanced uh, and protective of the right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Durkin, did you indicate you had a question? I can't, sort of kind of indicated, Chairman, all right there. Uh, I, go, I, this is something better that I, that I would have an insult. Uh, ironically and, and, and surprisingly, uh, I'm not all that convinced that the Constitution, the placing of the constitutional right to the Constitution is of any great assistance at all. Because my belief is this, that if we as, uh, as representatives, as legislators, are doing our job adequately and reflecting the needs of the communities we represent, it shouldn't be necessary to place it in the Constitution. A Constitution, and I've had this argument before with many, many people, Chairman, and as you probably know, uh, a Constitution is supposed to put down basic fundamentals, cornerstones, which protects the rights of the people in almost all instances. I don't think it is, it is, it is preferable. I, 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 it, it, is, it much better be that way. If we, one tends to use the Constitution as a means of providing legislation, I don't think that that's the right way to go about it. I think that it is far better to produce the legislation in line with uh, the ongoing requirements of the population that we represent, but also having due regard to the fundamentals laid down in the Constitution and various constitutions of various countries. And I accept that the, the UK doesn't have a written constitution, but it does have the Magna Carta, which it, which, which, which it operates, which it still operates uh, and, and has regard to at this stage. The other thing that I would refer to, incidentally, I must have the record in, in this thing because uh, uh, I certainly have uh, at, least, at least one case and, and more. Uh, of people being in emergency accommodation for three years and more. 
and growing and in appalling circumstances, despite numerous representations. And because of the vast uh, vastness of the housing need at the present time, all these people get crushed, they get squeezed in the crush, and it makes a, a huge problem. You, you reference to the, 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 the suitability of meeting the requirements of, of people's uh, special needs, special needs of, of adults and of children. I think that's, that's uh, it's appalling uh, to see uh, the degree to which individuals have families, have to try and strive all the time to, to deal with the requirements of rising from special needs and the housing needs at the same time and the failure to adapt to house in line with the special needs of the people concerned. And it is, it is, it is, it is tear-jerking, horrifying. To, to look at it. And there are many, many of those people in those circumstances at the present time and growing. So that, you know, there, there are other things that we need, to, we need to focus on. And what I'm really afraid of, I don't want to see a situation developing where we have to go to court in order to get uh, somebody uh, uh, the right to a house. It shouldn't be that way. We either reflect what the, what, what's, what's good and honest uh, uh, response, or we don't do it at all. And the last point I want to make, incidentally, special needs housing, as I've always said, uh, Mr Chairman, is best dealt with, especially by the, the, the voluntary agencies, without any shadow of doubt. The local authorities are not suitable to meeting that requirement at all. They don't do it well. Uh, they, don't, they, they don't do all the things that are necessary. And it's not by virtue of the fact that they're, that they're, they're uh, reticent. It's simply that their structures doesn't lend itself easily to it. And the, 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 um, I think that, that, that's, oh yes, the last point I wanted to make, Mr Chair, is this. All constitutional rights, to my mind, again, uh, the constitutional rights of one person should not override the constitutional rights of another or their neighbour. If, if, if we don't recognise that, I, I think we, we're, we're missing. So by putting in something in the constitution specifically to guarantee the rights of one group, you may then have somebody who is, who is creating antisocial behaviour in a particular situation, and they will go to court and they win their case on the basis that they're protected under the Constitution as well. And the, 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 other, the only other thing I would say is in relation to, to um, the, the travellers' um, housing rights. Like, uh, like everybody else, we, we, we deal with, we, 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 ha we have to deal, we, we have a, a responsibility to deal compassionately with every case that comes regardless of what their background is or where they come from or what the race, read, colour, whatever the case may be is, and we must do that. If, we do, if we're not doing that, we, if we do the pretense on that, well then we're not doing our job either. But it, should, it, go, it, goes to, it, 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 it follows that we shouldn't have a situation where travellers or any other body in society is forced to live at a crossroads or in the middle of a roundabout in, in appalling conditions while we all stand around and wring our hands. That's not, that's not doing the job that we were given to do. And under the, our constitution, there's already cover in it to deal with that if we, if we exercise ourselves. I'm sorry, Chairman, for ranting. You're, you're fine, uh, Deputy. I ju just before uh, uh, Ms. Regan comes back in, I suppose I just want to comment, and, and generally I don't comment on people's, but you, you, you mentioned about you know, the Constitution and would it be necessary or not, and legislation. I suppose the first thing I'd make, I just want to make as an observation, that legislation has to be constitutionally sound. Okay? And I suppose, reflecting some of the previous meetings, one of the issues that we've spoken about at this committee was in terms of access to land for house building and hoarding and all of that. And Minister Kelly, in my view, was quite explicit in his criticism, saying he was restricted in what he, the advice he, he got and what he was able to do in terms of the vacant site tax. And the purpose of the vacant site tax was to try and front load and make development land more available. Now, whether you agree with the argument or not doesn't matter for a moment. But he felt restricted because the existing property rights outweighed the right to housing and that was the way he more or less put it at the committee so I do think we have to have some regard from a constitutional point of view because that leads to the subsequent legislation and certainly he made the argument that he certainly indicated that he probably would like to have been stronger in what he did in other words that the tax was pushed out to 2019 is it and, and the rate was lower than he would have liked. And the reason was, the advice was, the existing property rights reflected in the Constitution uh, were what he was working around. And the argument we're suggesting is if you had a right to housing, would that be a balancing right in the Constitution? I don't expect an answer uh, from the committee, but I'm putting it as part of Deputy Durkin's comments because it's, a, it's nearly a counterbalance to some of what he said, for, for what it's worth. 
you, Chair, and thank you, Dep Deputy Durkin. Um, the, the first point you, you, you make is, is certainly true. If the job is being done adequately by the uh, by the government and by the Oireachtas, um, then the, there is no problem. Um, but the the fact of the matter is that a healthy society has the separation of powers, where uh, as a last resort, the courts keep a check on each body keeps a check on each other. Um, and as a last resort, um, it is very important to have some form of oversight over situations where the job is not being done properly. Now, that obviously is premised on the idea that the right to housing is a fundamental right, and we heard uh, Mr Drury uh, say that he considers it is a fundamental need and a fundamental right. And perhaps this crisis in homelessness is making us see that it is not, uh, this, is not about, uh, this is not about money, this is about shelter, this is about home, this is about security, um, and it is recognised as a fundamental right um, at a, in, in international human rights law, um, and so would sit quite very comfortably in the same way as education sits within the constitution, housing would sit very comfortably in there. Um, related to that, I suppose, in the fact that housing is recognised as a fundamental right, tomorrow, um, uh, as you, um, you may well be aware, Ireland is being reviewed by the, under the UN Universal Periodic Review and, and, and the Minister for Justice, Minister Fitzgerald, will be, is over in Geneva uh, for that and will be there tomorrow. And one of the big issues that is going to be raised by the missions there, as has been made, uh, we've been made aware uh, and as, as clear, is what's happening in Ireland in relation to homelessness, because it is seen to be a... a they want to hear what the state is doing because it is considered to be a breach of the, the right to housing as a fundamental right. So I suppose in terms of where it sits in, 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 within the right structure, it is, it is really well recognised as fundamental. Um, and this crisis has, has shown it uh, to be so, we would consider. Um, in terms of the balance of rights, it is absolutely true that uh, every right has to be balanced with other rights in a society, and that is, absolute, that is for sure. And earlier on and, and throughout perhaps the meetings of the committee, we've, there's been a lot of discussion of the, the, right, the rights to property in the, in the Constitution under Article 40.3.2 uh, 40 and under Article 43. Um, and the rights to property are very well enshrined in the Constitution. They relate to ownership of property, and we have no counterbalancing right in relation to any other form of home. And that's what the right to housing is about. It is about home, not simply property ownership. So in that sense, it's exactly as your point is about balancing rights. A very quick one uh, there, Chairman. Uh, that's, quick, that's, that's true. That's true. Can I put a scenario to you then that in the situation that prevailed during the boom, that I think we all remember now with not so much fondness, but however, uh, a property is purchased by, uh, sold by an individual who has owned the property traditionally to a second party who in turn transfers it to a third party, to a fourth party, to a fifth and sixth party on one occasion that I happen to know about. Uh, escalating the value of the property by sometimes up to ten times its original. Up to ten times. Now, here we go now. The, the, so, where do we come down on that? Is, what, what is the original price of that property? And to what extent does it, does, what is the current price of the property? And to what extent does it reflect an impact on the house cost prices now? My view on that is simply this, that the speculation, huge speculation was involved in it. Not a sod was ever turned. Not a sod was ever turned. It was purely speculation in, through, through uh, the availability of funding from lending institutions. Nothing else. And that has effectively prevented housing from, from being worthwhile or being available to a large number of people. Thank you, Deputy. Do you want to comment or are you... Well, I, I think that that is certainly true. That is absolutely true in terms of how house, pr house prices have escalated as, as a separate point to this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the questions we have. So at this stage, I'd like to thank uh, Maeve Regan for attending this afternoon. Uh, the written submission, uh, some of us have been at the launch. Uh, I think the, the launch was impressive and it was because of the launch a number of colleagues asked would you be prepared to attend today so it was in that context. Uh, thank you very much and as I say the documentation that was provided will be on the uh, website afterwards. Uh, that concludes today's meeting and we're adjourned until Thursday morning 10.30 um, when we have NAMA at 10.30 on Thursday. <laughs>